The Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference presents Leadership and Team Development for Managerial Success, a professional development seminar. Featuring Staff Chief Engineer for Northrop Grumman Corporation, Gregory West, Vice President, Women and Diverse B2B Marketing for IBM Corporation, Denise Evans, Practice Lead for Aerotech, Janine Gardner, an Executive Fellow for Naval Sea Systems Command, Dr. Renee Reynolds. When should you take on the role of mentor, of motivator and coach? Are you able to inspire your team members so that they can self-manage their tasks? Or do your teams crumble if you are not there to lead? In this seminar, our team of professionals will guide you to promote team cohesiveness and cooperation. You will learn what it takes to be a leader, to coach others, to communicate goals and ideas effectively, all while sharpening your team building skills to increase team productivity. Without further ado, the Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference presents Leadership and Team Development for Managerial Success. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. You can hear me well. Okay, the rule in this room, this is not church. You're not allowed to sit on the back row. Please come forward. Oh. Give the panel some love. We all got up very early this morning to be here, and we want to engage you in a conversation. So the further you come up front, the easier it is for us to do that. Unless you're looking for your escape group, and I understand sitting on the back row. So my name is Denise Evans. I'm going to be your moderator for the panel today. Um, I have some housekeeping notes. The um, Remind attendees to have badges scanned when entering the session, except there's nobody out there to scan them. If you're looking for the Morgan State University um, continuing education units or professional development hours, there is a place to register at a table near the registration desk. So if you go out there and ask them, they will go ahead and scan your badge for your credits. PowerPoint slides for the entire conference will be posted after the conference. And if you have your phones or a piece of paper, they will be posted at www.slideshare.net slash ccmag. I'll repeat it at the end of the session. Um, we're going to run the session with a panel discussion for about 45 minutes. And then I'm going to try to keep 20 to 25 minutes at the end for your questions. So if you have questions during the session, jot them down. I'm going to ask you to come to the mic, state your name, title, organization, and no commercials, just a brief question so that we can get in as many questions as we can. Um, social media. You can download the Bayer app if you haven't already in the iPhone app store or the Google Play store. They want you to follow us on Twitter at Bayer Technology and join us on Facebook at Bayer STEM. If you are not here for the Leadership and Team Development for Managerial Success session, now would be a good time to exit before we talk about you later on. <laughs> so in this seminar, our team of professionals will guide you to promote team cohesion and cooperation. I'd like to introduce the panelists. Starting from my near left, well, let me first go through the learning objectives. And so at the end of this session, you should walk away with the best leadership skills, best leadership styles, visualizing goals and communicate, and developing high performance teams, OK? So in order to do that, we've got an expert panel here today with us, starting with Janine Gardner to my near left. Janine is an experienced practice lead overseeing the professional service division for Aerotech. Anybody here from Aerotech? Ooh. Fan club in the house. <laughs> She's responsible for leading, mentoring, and developing sales and recruiting teams. She's responsible for teaching and holding sales and recruiting teams accountable to expected performance standards. She's also responsible for building strong partnerships with clients and creating strategic solutions to their unique business needs, implementing new strategies to, divide, to drive diversity and inclusion to the field offices by focusing on talent recruitment, 
retention awareness, and community outreach. Please, let's welcome Janine Gardner Thank to the you. stage. Thank you. I'm going to skip over the gentleman in the middle, and I'm going to my far, far left to introduce Renee Reynolds, Dr. Renee Reynolds. She is an executive fellow at the Naval Sea Systems Command. She was commissioned as an ensign in the United States Navy, entering the Navy's surface warfare community in the year 2000. Renee completed her initial sea tour on the USS Nashville, then commenced training through the Navy's nuclear power program, a program focused on the operation of the Navy's nuclear power reactors at sea. Upon completion of this pipeline, she reported to the USS Theodore Roosevelt, serving, as a, serving a tour as a reactor electrical division officer where she supervised personnel operating the nuclear propulsion systems. And then she left active duty in 2005 and transferred to the Naval Reserve, where for the following two years she worked implementing the Navy Knowledge Online. After leaving active duty, Dr. Reynolds worked for various government contractors in developing technical and engineering solutions for the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of the Navy. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science from Hampton University, a Master's of Science in Engineering Management from Old Dominion, a PhD in Business Management specializing in Strategy and Innovation from Capella University, and she's currently pursuing in her spare time a Master's of Liberal Arts in the Extension Studies of Digital Media Design at Harvard University. Please welcome Dr. Renee Reynolds. Good morning. And our presenting panelist, Mr. Gregory West, is staff engineer of the Product Technical Leadership Organization for the Northrop Grumman Corporation. Is there anybody here from Northrop Grumman? Oh, oh, they got bass in their nice. voice. <laughs> Good to see. <laughs> Gregory is responsible for multiple million dollar programs for civilians, reconnaissance, and land forces and self-protection business divisions. He's the IPT lead for the AWACS Electronic Protection Program Hardware, responsible for the design and development of production hardware for the Air Force. Um, the, the AWACS programs are also in Japan, Saudi Arabia, and MESA teams in Australia, so he is a global citizen. Gregory is a graduate right here in D.C. of Howard University with a B.S. In, in Electrical Engineering, a Master's of Engineering with a concentration in Electrical Engineering from Loyola College, and a Master's of Science in Engineering with a concentration in Organizational and Technical Management from the John Hopkins University. Please welcome Gregory West. So I'm going to turn it over to Gregory. Here's your clicker. So good morning, everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to see everyone show up so early in the morning. I hope everyone has their coffee. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to start this session off. We want to basically try to give everyone a set of skills uh, for those who are new to management or leadership, those who have been in leadership for some time, and those who have, uh, have uh, been around for even longer. So this is going to be a bit of a broad stroke in how to become, uh, develop your leadership skills, advance your leadership skills uh, to make you a much better leader going forward. And the way we're going to run this, this panel, we're going to basically do a little bit of storytelling. Uh, and we want to have fun today. So I encourage you to uh, make this an interactive session. So uh, have questions. You know, let's have a dialogue. Let's communicate. So <clears throat> the way we plan to do this is you look at this slide here, and you see there's a series of questions, I mean, uh, words on the, on the panel. And um, so I'm going to start off with uh, purpose. Um, and that's a, a key trait, a key skill I think every leader should have as you move forward in building um, a team of leading people. And when I look back over my career, I've been in this business for a few years. Uh, I started out in avionics. Uh, I moved to space. I actually had a product on a space shuttle, which was pretty neat. I moved to underwater. 
I've started sonar systems, uh, the vertical launching systems. I worked on that. Um, I did start out in, in some work in robotics, uh, towed systems, uh, and small satellites. So I've done a whole lot of work. And as, as I worked through these various programs in the industry, one of the things that I worked, I learned is when I worked with a team, I had to establish um, the purpose. I had to uh, help the team figure out that there's a purpose and a reason for making all this work. And uh, <clears throat> so one program that I worked on was a, um, a very advanced, uh, high-powered um, uh, amplifier, something that had never been done before. Uh, and the challenge that I put before my team was we got to figure out how to do this because our customer needed it. It was something that uh, was totally different and the, the, the excitement of doing something that had never been done before. And the fact that it would give our customer an advantage over its competitor. So that was the purpose. And I, and, and, and I instilled that excitement in the team. And so that was the, the, the skill set that I developed over the years, was finding that, that way to excite the team. And that was the purpose. Trust was the next thing that I learned over the years. Um, and one, uh, there was a time when I was testing <clears throat> out in Puget Sound. Uh, we were doing a uh, sonar system, underwater system, uh, dragging a uh, towed body through the water. Uh, and you know, you, you're working <clears throat> real long hours trying to make the system work. And the team is really frustrated. I mean, because things aren't working well. Um, and you have to let, the team has to recognize the fact that you have a skin in the game. And so they need to trust you because when they see that you're there with them, trying to make this thing happen, you put in the long hours right beside them and they trust you. And they trust you that you're gonna look out for them. And that's the skill set that I learned when I'm working with my team out in the field, and I carry that throughout my entire career. Very good, thank you. Um, for me, a couple of the words that, that speak volumes to me, is, one is relationships. Um, the type of industry I work in, I work in the, in the uh, staffing recruiting field, and we're working with <clears throat> different people from multiple companies, different recruiters, different personalities. Um, so there is actually a strategy in finding a way to create a good relationship, a good working relationship with your team. Um, and in years past, you know, I was a terrible manager. Um, you know, I wasn't even showing up as a leader with my team because, because we are a high producing company. I just thought, you know, here's the work, here are the positions, let's fill, let's fill the opportunities. And I was very direct with my recruiters. Um, and it took some time for someone to actually give me some real feedback to show me how I was showing up with my, my associates. Because I thought if I was, was going to bring in the opportunities and that they're filling the positions, um, that was just my job. And I realized after that person gave me that feedback of, hey, you need to show up more as a leader with this individual and show them that you care. Um, so that took a lot of time for me to evaluate myself and figure out like, hey, how am I going to get to that point? Um, being vulnerable with your associates, no matter what industry you're in, is so important because vulnerability builds trust. Yep. Um, and that's how you create a really strong community. So evaluating relationships and being present, like I know that we are all busy. Um, even when someone comes into the office and you're typing and they're talking, just even turning around and looking at them just shows that, they, that you care. So just being present in the moment is so important um, in building relationships. The other um, word up there is goals. Again, Aerotech, very demanding job, right? We all work very demanding um, uh, with demanding companies. And if you don't have those relationships to, pu to push your team to actually hit certain metrics and certain goals, you know, there's no real buy-in, right? Um, so with goals, you have to set clear expectations and you have to hold people accountable. 
and celebrate the wins. So when you are achieving certain goals, let your team know that you are you know, proud of them, whether it's taking them out to lunch, right, or doing small little celebrations in the office has been so important to our success. And that's why our culture is so strong at our company. Good morning. So to kind of piggyback off of what Janine was saying, um, you know, looking at words just kind of resonates with me for the past 20 years because unknowingly I got thrown into leadership at a very young age from being a naval officer. So uh, things like relationships, commitment, empathy, confidence, self-awareness. Self-awareness is the biggest one. I know for me, after I got off of active duty, you know, I probably had a, a very false sense of confidence. Oh, you know, I thought to myself, I can run, you know, I've run a nuclear reactor. I can run a restaurant, bought a restaurant. Um, and what I realized when I had that venture is that dealing with a, you know, a civilian retail staff was very, very, very different than dealing with a military staff. Um, out of all of my experiences, I feel like that was probably one of the most humbling because I had to learn a lot about myself. I had to, you know, say, okay, maybe in this situation you're not being empathetic or you're not understanding, you know, certain sectors. And from that point, you know, I had to work on things like, you know, learning different types of situational leaderships, um, you know, when to be transformational, when to, you know, not be diplomatic and things of that nature. And it's taken a very long time. You know, but I think now, so I've been at Naval Sea Systems Command now for eight years. Um, and even though that community is somewhat of an extension of the military because you work with a lot of veterans and it's still a Department of Defense, it's still a civilian organization. It's just, you know, getting to the point where sometimes you just, you know, you shake your head and you just say, okay, and, you know, you keep going or times when you have to put your foot down. So... You know, it's, it's been a very, very wild 20-year ride for me. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about leadership styles. Um, and I, I, I thought this, this image of Morpheus was, was pretty interesting because leadership styles, they, they vary and they have to vary. So situational leadership, I think, is really important. Um, there is no such thing as a fixed style. They, all, they vary depending upon the situation um, and, and what's going on during that time. Um, at that moment, things change. As a functional manager, um, when I had a, uh, uh, to lead uh, a, a group of, you know, of uh, engineers, uh, you know, you got a lot of Disciplinary action sometimes, uh, where you got to take action. You have to uh, sometimes terminate people for 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 good cause. Uh, you have to promote people. You have to train people, um, and, and you have to listen. You know, uh, and you have to give direction as a team leader. As you, uh, so I, I guess I'm trying to say that you know. I've been on the side of where I'm a functional manager, where I have a group of people that I function to manage. I've also been on the side where I manage program side, where I'm leading teams where you got to have be uh, give direction. You, have, you also have to be collaborative. You need to listen to your team and make decisions, not just because you think it's the right thing to do, but you need to listen to your team and make the best decision for the program. So you need to have that situational leadership where you you change your mind based on the input you get from your team. And, and um, there was a case um, in point where I was working on a, um, a unique sonar system uh, with um, this, this uh, manager that I worked with. He was uh, one of the best managers I ever worked for. And I learned the importance of situational leadership really from this guy great manager, um, he recognized when things had to change and he adapted quickly, very, very quickly. Um, he uh, was a great coach. When he, 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 he recognized when people needed to, uh, they needed to be uh, 
pushed in a certain direction. I learned that skill from him. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is you need, you as new leaders going forward, you need to be able to move in different directions based on the situation at hand. And, and um, I found that being a collaborative leader has worked for me in my programmatic role and in my functional role. And, um, and again, there were times when you had to be a, um, an authoritarian. Uh, and one last point. Um, I also learned that uh, there are times when you have to lead without authority. Uh, I was a, uh, a leader in the uh, ERG world. ERG is an employee resource group. And uh, I stood up an organization um, in, in a, a new ERG group, and I did not have any authority at all. Uh, none. No money, nothing. <laughs> and, but I had to reach out into the community in, at, that, at that site and get those individuals to come with me to build this new group. And uh, so you learn how to, how to find those things that, in, that interest people without authority. You learn how to, again, trust. You get people to trust you into an idea. You, you, you present people with an idea, a, a concept. You, you, uh, you sell this, this, this thing of an ERG and the, the importance of it and how it will help them. The relationships, all of that. And so I'm saying that you need to also learn how to, to be a good leader without authority as well as be a leader with authority. Because there are times when you need to have both. I think the other thing is being open to feedback, which is hard to take. Um, knowing how we show up with our folks and, you know, sometimes when we give feedback to them all the time, every day, right? It's kind of like beating them down with a dead, like a dead, dead horse. Um, so we have to be, create an environment where feedback is allowed. Um, where you can take someone else's feedback, whether they're positive or negative, um, and give them the same, share that same light with them. Because um, you want people to know that you care about their development, like, you know, helping them get to that next job or that next opportunity. Um, has, it's been one of the key aspects of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, because I need my team to know that I want them to be in my seat in a couple of years, whatever that is. Um, so showing that and valuing um, who they are as a person, what their background is, understanding their family, you know, work-life balance, whatever it may be, just making sure that they know that you care is so important, and that will allow you to go above and beyond um, to hit whatever goal it is or to finish whatever project it is. So I think that's also really important. Hey, Gregory, if I might, um, I'd like to ask a question of the panel. Can, does anybody have an example of servant leadership? That's one of the newer terms that are out these days in terms of a type of leadership. Okay, so is, is everybody familiar with what servant leadership is? No? So it's, <clears throat> So a lot of these leadership theories, right? Uh, there's a lot of academic research on it. So I had to study a lot of it, unfortunately. But um, you know, if you look at just the basis of the word, it really describes what it is. Is that you know, as a servant leader, you're somebody that is here to serve the industry that you're in, which is also serving the people in that industry, right? So you look at some of the terms like. Um, you know, being in a, in a coaching relationship, a mentorship relationship, or giving back. That's really the basis of what servant leadership is. And um, it's one of the newer 21st century leadership theories um, and organizational theories. And really what it just boils down to is, what am I doing to give back? What am I doing to contribute to these organizations? Um, and if you think about it, 
if you had a, you know, if you think about maybe a, a manager or a mentor that you've had before, somebody that really invested in you, that took the time to kind of, you know, show you the ropes. So my example that I can think of, because I've had a lot of great managers, is um, my senior executive. It's funny because, um, you know, for many years, I would not really look at applying to leadership programs because uh, NAFC is a huge organization. And then this one particular day, I go into this guy's office and he's sitting in a chair and just kind of leaning back like this. So at first I'm like, where am I at? What am I doing here? And he didn't even say good morning or good afternoon to me. What he did, he took my resume and he threw it on a table. He said, what's wrong with you? What do you mean what's wrong with me? How come you haven't applied for these programs? Who's been helping you? Who's your mentor? And why has it been this long since you've been off of my particular radar? So you know when you walk into somebody's office and that's the first thing they say to you, you're just like, uh, you know, you don't know what to say. But after, you know, he took about an hour and a half with me and sat down and explained some things to me and helped me find direction because unfortunately I was in an organization that kind of had a dead end and I became a part of that culture where I was like, you know what, I'm going to be here for a lot longer than I had intended to. And, you know, with his guidance and his coaching, I'm actually working for him right now. And he's getting a Bayer Award today, which is awesome. But um, it helped me get back on track to where I needed to go. And his form, and you know, I've seen him over time do this with people. He he, does, he emphasizes servant leadership because at this point he's gotten so far ahead. He spends half of his day, every single day, mentoring people. And I asked him, I said, why do you spend so much time doing this? He said, if I don't do it, who will? And I swear out of the majority of senior executives that I've seen, I've never seen anybody that takes time to mentor and invest in people and guide people the way that he does. You might also say that I'm, this is a really good chart, um, looking at, he's a pace setter too, because with his questions to you, why haven't you, why haven't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he put the responsibility put the back on me, yes. right. and the urgency back on me. And it's, you know, I've always been somebody that has, you know, gotten, you know, always had, okay, this is what I'm gonna do next with my career. But, you know, we're human. And there are some times where we don't have that internal, not motivation, but the push and the drive at that moment to go to that next step. And we all need encouragement, no matter what we've accomplished in our lives. So this is such a good slide, um, Gregory, mm-hmm. that you've put together. Yeah. I think I'd like to go to audience and Absolutely. see if, they, if anybody has a question about a particular um, leadership style, just come to the mic and um, be great. or stand up and speak loudly. I can address that. Um, so I, I introduce myself. I work for IBM. I've been there in technology for over 40 years. And um, autocratic is situational. I become very autocratic in crises. My leadership style normally is very different than that. But when it comes down to it, the crisis, the clock is ticking, time is whatever, I'm very tell. I'm very do, 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 do. Don't ask me any questions. Don't waste my time. Don't ask me why. Just do it so that we can meet a deadline. So that's kind of autocratic. I think, probably Christine, you have some examples of that. I'm sorry, Renee, you have some examples of that. And it's, you know, it is situational because um, when you are somebody that is normally collaborative and adaptive, when you are autocratic, a lot of times you don't get pushback from your staff because they know at that point if you're saying do something. Right. You know, as I mean, a lot of it too is that if you lead with common sense and, you know, empathy, your staff knows that when you say, hey, I need you to do this. And even if they say why, you'd be like, you know, like, you know what, don't even worry about it right now. We just need to get it done. They'll go off and do it because they've gained that trust in you as a leader that you are going in the right direction or you wouldn't ask them to do something, um, you know, that, or you're asking them to do something that you normally wouldn't ask, but there's a reason behind it and they go with it. Well, and just to follow up, I think sometimes you gotta be a little bit careful with uh, being an autocratic, because you can uh, become a, a dictator uh, and, and, and um, 
sometimes that that can be good, and then sometimes that can be bad, right? I mean, there's there can be two sides of that coin. Um, sometimes you do have to just put your foot down. This is how we're going to do it. Done, right? Uh, but sometimes being a dictator, uh, you can become just closed-minded, and you're not you're not seeing both. You're not seeing anything. You're not listening. You you just you're just blind. You just put your blinders on and you're just going, and you 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 tend to just miss uh, all, everything around you, and uh, that can be a real problem because there could be some really great answers out there that you're just refusing to see. So you got you got to be a little bit careful here with being an autocratic um, style, right? Because it can become a dictatorship. Yeah, you got to be a little bit careful with that. So most people do have a, a dominant style, but then the rest of the styles are more situational, as Gregory was saying. I don't think you ever want to be an autocratic as your dominant style. You won't last <laughs> right. very long. Are there other <laughs> questions about other styles up here? Yes. Well, I've, um, I think I, I've gravitated more to uh, collaborative and transformational as my career has moved forward. Um, I know in the in my early career um, with managers and leaders uh, in my early career it was more autocratic. That was a predominant style then. Uh, that clearly has changed. Uh, that, that's, no, that's no longer the case. Uh, but my style, my personal style, has, has become more collaborative and transformational. Janine? Um, I'd say collaborative and coaching um, are the two. Like Gregory said, I mean, your leadership style is always going to change a little bit and also should change for the person that you're working with, right? Um, but I've always, um, or ha I've always had a more coaching mindset um, to develop my folks, right, and get them to the next level, so. Yeah, I agree. It depends on the audience for, you know, I know that, you know, obviously military-wise, it's more autocratic because there are a lot of processes and procedures in place in that environment. But for the work that I do now, which is, um, or was before this position, which was more of like a technical and engineering management, you had a lot of groups, projectized groups that you work with. So a lot of that, you know, you ended up having to adapt and then also be transactional. It's like, okay, here's a transaction that we have to complete or the job we have to complete. And, you know, how are we all going to collaborate to do it? So it's a mixture that you have to use. And kind of like they were saying is that when you use one specific style and you're not able to vary that, that's kind of what you get known for. You don't want to get trapped in that box because every situation is different. Other questions? All right, so um, have you all ever had had a situation where you were managing people and um, the there was a need for more work to be done or people to work longer hours or not necessarily, well, yeah, it could be longer hours and there might not have been more compensation available yet? Um, how do you motivate people in those type of environments? Um, yeah. I can speak towards that. Um, so yes, because we're in the staffing <laughs> industry. So, you know, some of even our, if you think about it, some of our ramp projects, whether it's with like a Northrop or whoever it may be, um, there are certain deadlines that we have to hit. Um, we have to talk about the actual opportunity as a whole um, and how our recruiters are compensated, right? It's, it's per placement. So even the work that they're doing prior to, um, we have to explain to them you know, the opportunity of them getting compensated, right? Um, they're not, even though they're gonna work 10, 11 hours a day, right? The opportunity, um, once they find that right candidate or they're able to hit those numbers with that ramp project, that's what we have to talk about is, the, is the, the goal itself. We're not living in the moment of, hey, we need you to work late tonight. Um, we, they understand the why behind it and, and how that also affects our customer and why it's so important to hit that deadline, um, that start date, um, because it's gonna help you know, the customer itself. So we try to explain it as a whole versus saying like, hey, I need you to work late tonight. Can you do it, right? So I'll take one more before we move on. Um, so most of you said you have a dominant style. So 
Um, have you changed that dominant style based on managing individual contributors versus managing managers? Good question. Yeah, so um, it, it goes back to learning how to manage different types of people, you know, because sometimes you have managers and your managers, you know, don't know how to manage themselves. So you have to help them manage themselves too. Right. And I mean, you know, it sounds crazy, but the principle, you know, if you look it up, it's called managing up. It's like an actual thing, you know? Um, and then you also sometimes, you know, not to generalize age groups, but then you may have, you know, millennials versus baby boomers. And depending on what team you're on, you, you may have to, you know, you might have somebody on your team that's maybe in their early 20s and somebody's in their 60s. So it's just being aware of your style, the way that you're coming across and finding ways. I mean, to me, most of it in the environments that we work in are some form of collaborative management. You have to collaborate with this person. They are your team member. You need to invest with them because sometimes you meet meet an older employee that would say, okay, why you, know, you ask them, why are you in this job so long? They're like, well, I've never had anybody help me write a resume. Or, you know, you have people that have your, I want a career change. So you have to make sure that across the board, you get to know people, you're fair with them. And when you do that, you're able to determine which leadership style to apply to them as a person. And then sometimes those people, they can be influencers for you as well. So they can help influence your management style for a larger group as well. Okay, thank you. And also know that in managing up, um, you guys all have styles. Mm -hmm. So something you might consider when you're, when you're in a new situation with a new leader, a new manager, let them know what motivates you, right. let them know what, what style motivates you the most. You know, do I like to be told everything to do or do I like to collaborate or do I like, it's okay to manage up. In fact, managers appreciate it when you manage up because it makes their, their job a little bit easier. easier. Yeah. It makes their yeah. job easier, for sure. Yeah. So let's move on. You're listening to Leadership and Team Development for Managerial Success, a professional development seminar featuring Gregory West, Denise Evans, Janine Gardner, and Dr. Renee Reynolds. Brought to you by the Global Catalyst for Change, the Bay of STEM Global Competitiveness Conference, where we make the untapped potential possible. Be sure to check out our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Okay, so um, we're going to get into some goals, settings, and communication. So we all, we've all seen SMART, right? Uh, we all know that one. It's standard, works out all the time. SMART, specific, measurable, um, achievable, realistic, timely. That's why it takes us to set up a goal and to get it done. All right. So, um, no, nothing magical here. Tried and true, it works every time. And so, um, and that's is, is exactly what I do to set up a goal on my teams. Um, set up specific goals that are measurable, uh, and set up a timeline with all my teams to get it done, uh, make sure it's realistic, and we accomplish it. And that's typically done with a schedule. You, know, you get it planned. Um, just periodically check it off, make sure that things are happening. It's just like any schedule, there are typically some hiccups along the way, but you adjust and you figure out how to uh, either get back on plan or make some other arrangements, but you do your best to try to stay on plane and get it done. And uh, communications, um, I think one of the big things there is, is um, being an active listener. From That's one of, the, one of the big techniques for me is just to listen, listen to people. Uh, I think a lot of times um, um, early on, I think folks, people don't really listen. Don't take the time to listen. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's always terrible when you go into your boss's office and um, he's actually looking at the screen and not looking at you. Because, you know, it's like, well, you're not paying attention to what I just said. Uh, or actually, he could be actually looking at you and you look, you look in his eyes and he's like, well, something is not connecting. Um, <laughs> Now, I'm looking at you. I'm looking in your eyes, but <laughs> you didn't hear a word I said. You know, and, and, and you know it. You, you can see it, right? And it's like, well, dude, why are you wasting my time, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and th this is where I think leadership really needs to be fixed, right? Uh, it's so important to be an active listener. Listen to your people. And, and I think one of the ways that you can... One of the techniques that I use is parrot it back, right? You hear what a person says, and say, you say, well, let me, let me repeat myself. Let me repeat what you said. I may not say it exactly what you said it, but let me make sure I understood what you said. And I think that is how you have good, start, at least start having good communication. And I use that a lot. And, and, I, and that way, I always have good communication with people, at least I try to. Uh, so that's a great technique that I've used. Um, and that's a great way to establish trust, right? But people start, once you start communicating that way, people say, well, okay, you actually heard me. Man, you know, he didn't just sit there and just look at me while his mind was somewhere else, you know, his eyes were glazed over. Uh, you know, often some fairy tale land, right? <laughs> And um, so I think that's so important from, uh, from a communication perspective. Um, and, and also, when you actually listen, you can actually start resolving real conflict. Because then you hear what's going on. And then you can say, okay, well, now I see why you did this, or why you did that, or why you misunderstood what somebody said, right? Uh, so I, I Communication is so important. I think just active listening, to me, is the key thing from a leadership perspective when it comes to communication. Um, I agree with you 100%. I, I think I mentioned this before, just being present. People want to feel um, their value, that they're valued, that you care about them, um, that you care about their opinion. So just being present, being in the moment is so, so important. And it's hard to... Um, train yourself sometimes because your mind is thinking about the next deadline or the next project or I need to call this person. Like, I feel like a crazy person half the time because I'm like thinking about it and I'm like, okay, let me breathe. Let me, <laughs> let me take a step back, right? And just be in the moment. And I, this is a little sidebar, but I, I started meditating just because I need to do that in the morning just to keep my mind very clear and making sure that I'm actually being present with my people because I have a lot going on at once. Um, so it's definitely something everyone should look into because just quick five, 10 minutes, this is not a meditation plug, but it is, um, can really help you in, in your thought process and being present with your team. Yeah. Um, so that's that. Yeah, we have become so yeah. just, these are oh. leashes, right? <laughs> have you ever walked in somebody's office and they're just like this, and they're like this? I just took a picture, but still, you know, <laughs> like, and then you're talking and you're just like, oh my God, this person is not listening to me. Right. So you have to in turn, if you feel like somebody is not listening and it's really important what your message is, you in turn have to be bold sometimes, you know, politely bold, you know, or sometimes not politely bold. Did you hear what I said? You know, I've had to do that before uh, because I knew I only had two to three minutes of time with somebody and there was no second shot. Did you? And then just like that, the person just focused. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, especially a lot of us STEM people, we, you know, these are called soft skills, you know, and they say that we engineers and we scientists, we're not that great at the communication aspect and, you know, we're more introverted and things like that, right? That's what they say a lot of times generally. Do things like if you've never done an active listening training or exercise, try it. And basically what it is, you sit there, you pair up with somebody or even a group, and you have to spend two to three minutes 
uh, not taking notes, listening to everything that they say. You can't ask questions, you can't do anything. And then after that, you go back and kind of reiterate what they're saying. And, you know, it sounds simple enough, but it's so hard sometimes not to talk when somebody's talking straight for two to three minutes. But what it does, it helps you focus. Mm -hmm. Additionally, if you've never um, taken, you know, any class or training or had exercise on establishing SMART goals and mission and vision statements, you know, as leaders, those are things that are very, very valuable because what it does, it helps you to, um, with your business or whatever your goal is, to really be able to hone in and verbalize it and articulate it in a manner that you can, that somebody can look at this and say, I know exactly what you're trying to do. And it, it, it's a skill. It takes time to learn how to really say, this is what I want to do. It's um, also very helpful professionally because the hardest thing in the world is to write about yourself. When it comes to those, um, you know, like your yearly performance reports, you know, a lot of people struggle with that writing. So when you write it, you know, one, write it for the next level, but then always write it and think of it, this is what my mission statement is. This is what my vision statement is. This is my personal marketing plan for myself because I want my managers and my leadership to know that I wanna be a leader. I wanna be a communicator. I wanna be a player in this field. Okay, so let's talk about social media and communication too, right? Everybody on LinkedIn? Okay, so what is, you know, somebody just stand up, what does your picture look like on LinkedIn? Okay, so there's some industries where other pictures are appropriate. Like if you're an artist, you know, um, certain pictures are good, right? But I think generally for this audience, we have a very standard, you know, suit ties, some flag in the background, maybe the crossed arms, pictures, you know, <laughs> pretty standard, right? So, uh, you know, with the social media, um, it's unfortunately nowadays, that is another form of communication, right? What you look like is usually the first thing people see before they read your bio, right? So number one, if you're lo in lo on LinkedIn, do have a picture on there because one, it shows a certain level of transparency, right? And you want to be approachable if you are looking for jobs, opportunities, things of that nature. If you're not, you know, understandable. But then two, be very cognizant of the way that you're communicating on social media, you know? And I'm, I'm talking specifically LinkedIn, right? Um, what opportunities are you trying to go after? What audience are you, you know, are you trying to reach? Um, even unless you're somebody that's within that type of environment as your, your job, you know, even how much, you know, how much do you put into political postings and things of that nature? Um, sometimes people confuse being on LinkedIn as a platform to tell all of your opinions about every single thing. Um, I would just say you may want to reserve some of that in that forum, but then also you use it as a tool. If you see somebody that's doing something that you'd like to do, don't be scared to send them an email or a message like, hey, I'm sending you this firm request because you do this and I think it's awesome. You know, do you have, you know, would you like to communicate with me? You know? Use that as opportunities. I've gotten so many opportunities just off of LinkedIn. And in turn, I try to take the time to, you know, everybody that messages me, I try to take the time to answer them too, because you never know when you can enrich somebody's lives by just giving them a little bit of advice. Yeah. Okay. So Renee, I have a question. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, you probably don't want to have all your political views on LinkedIn, uh, depending upon where you are in your career and your duties, are there things that, from your career perspective or career duties that you should or should not have on LinkedIn? I think it's dependent on the field that you're in. Like for me, I mean, I'm a government employee. I do not put anything political on my page. Uh, it's not advisable. 
Um, and in all honesty, that's not where I put my focus as far as career-wise. Um, I do have maybe about two or three personal pictures. And when I mean personal, that means of members of my family on LinkedIn, but they are connected job-wise. So I'll give an example. I have a picture uh, of my mother when I got commissioned. And, you know, back then, there we didn't have iPhones. We didn't have... You know, we have the digital cameras, the ones you stick the, the memory card in. So I don't have a lot of pictures from being on active duty. But this particular year when I posted this picture, my mother had just passed away, you know, two months before that. And, you know, just going through some old pictures and I saw it. And I was like, man, this, you know, this lady was with me forever. You know, like, so that was my Veterans Day picture of, you know, me and my mother. And I was in my uniform. And I always say, you know, the, the post basically talked about how she set the foundation for me in life and how I hope that, you know, in her not being here anymore, that I continue that foundation. So that's where I was able to relate that very personal picture of me to what I do as a profession, because it's kind of what my, you know, she's my building block. So that's the only time I would put something kind of personal on there. And again, for me, I just stay away from politics. I don't even touch it. Some of the things that I've done um, through LinkedIn is more recently just realizing how important it is to build your brand and that people are watching. So whether you're part of a, a, an organization, um, being cognizant to actually post like once a week is so good for your brand and where you're trying to go within your career. Um, because you'll be surprised that people will respond and, and people will message you directly. Um, there's, a, there's a really strong, powerful community within LinkedIn. Um, quick story, when I moved um, back to Philadelphia and I was starting off in a new territory, I was just pinging people and asking them for a referral. Um, and I was so shocked with how strong our community was with just getting me out to introductions, sharing cell phone numbers with managers, hiring managers that I would even, you know, imagine that happening through LinkedIn. Um, so you have to be very cognizant of your brand, what you're, you know, representing um, and what you do, right? Be specific, explain your job, like share more about what you do from a day-to-day -day standpoint so people know if they can give you a referral or, you know, they can help you for whatever it may be. So. So um, if you haven't noticed, I'm not going to leave time at the end for questions. So this would be the time to be interactive. I think it's better once the chart is up um, for us to be interactive. And this is our last slide. So please do ask questions as we move along. OK. So how do we build high performance teams? Um, so I, um, I've been able to build some high performance teams through my career. I've, uh, built teams to build some really advanced products over the years, um, products for NASA, uh, uh, for uh, satellite systems. I've built products for uh, undersea systems, uh, underwater systems, sonar systems. I've built products for uh, towed body systems, for uh, robotic systems. Um, uh, for multifunction sensor systems that uh, doing some pretty amazing things. And, um, and so you want to do is, you know, you obviously you want is to find that talent in your organization that um, uh, has a skill set to do this work uh, and you offer them that challenge and and then you give them that opportunity to to excel you give them the tools to perform um, you give them the space to collaborate uh, you give them the things that they need to get the job done uh, and, and 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 that's what i've been able to do throughout my career is I build high performance teams. I listen to them uh, and, and, 
And as you build, as you listen, uh, you make changes. And I've been able to make changes and adapt to, to uh, I've been agile. Uh, I think that's the word I like to use is, is being uh, agile with high performance teams. Uh, and the good, the thing about doing high performance teams is, is I don't have to know everything. And typically I don't. Uh, I know enough to be dangerous, uh, but I let them who have the real skill sets to get the job done and done well, I give them the space to get it done properly, uh, give them everything to do to make sure it's all done right, and then we celebrate at the end. And one thing uh, I mentioned earlier about this particular manager that I work for, uh, and that's one of the greatest leaders that I ever, I ever worked for. Uh, one thing that he, he, he demonstrated was the, the, uh, the ability to have fun. And that's one of the things that I always have with my teams when I build them, is to make sure you have fun at the end of the day. And uh, with high performance teams, we always have fun. And I think as long as we can have fun, and, and, and I don't, I don't, mean, I don't mean that in some flippant way. I mean, you know, when uh, we accomplish a task and we get something done and done well, we celebrate. And, 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 um, I, and I reward my team for a job well done. And it, you don't always succeed because, you know, you're doing things that haven't been done before. So sometimes it, it doesn't work out so well. But even when that happens, you still celebrate because you learn and you do better the next time. And they, but either way, you celebrate, you have fun. And I always have fun with my team and my team enjoys having fun. Um, before we move on, just to level set, um, could, could you guys describe what is a high performance team and how do you know when you have one? And then second, what attributes are you looking for in people that you're inviting to be? on your high performance team as a leader? Okay, Anybody? so I have a list of, of just certain words that I think of okay. when combined make up a high performance team. So diversity, inclusion, innovative, creative, collaborative, bold, driven, respectful, measurable, agile, adaptive, knowledgeable, invested, but both internally to the team and also externally. So two different types of investment, humble and then growing or growth. So to me, those are some of the aspects of a high performing team. You know, um, when you see somebody that it's always, I wanna do this, I wanna do this, I'm so motivated. That's a great team member. Because a lot of times you can take that person, you know, some people may like, oh, that person is too competitive. We don't want them on a team, but they're probably really driven. And you have to initially think the best of people when you meet them, right? So you add them on there and you give them their specific duties where they're able to shine, but also helping them, you know, and that goes back to the coaching style, teaching them how to function on a team. Um, you know, you have introverts, you know, I'm an ambivert. I go kind of in between both sometimes, right? So you might have an introvert. And you take those introverts and, you know, maybe not initially pair them up with the entire team, but they give them one person that, you know, can kind of help them um, just kind of develop and communicate a little bit better. Because with teams, you want to help them grow their different areas of leadership and also help to expose them to certain skills that may, they may not be strong on and pair them with somebody that is. Can you stand up and speak louder, please? So they can hear you in the back as well. Um, I have my own mentor. I need to realize how I'm showing up with my, with my mentor, right? Um, because he is helping me develop and continuing to develop. Um, we can't just stop where we are and think that us managing people is going to be sufficient for our growth. We need to find an advocate. We need to find a mentor um, to help us continue to grow. Um, so I don't know if you guys have anything else. Yeah, and, and with that, having, having different types of mentors, yeah. right? Don't choose somebody that just does what you do or looks just like you, mm -hmm. right? 
choose different mentors. If you're um, in electrical engineering, go choose somebody in finance, right, or HR. Yeah. Somebody that's completely different that you would have no idea what they would usually do because that gives you a very, very different perspective of the business. Mm -hmm. yeah. totally question in the back. Great question. And it starts with culture, right? Culture of the organization as well as your team. So I will, yeah. I'll start. Yeah, um, I, I work for IBM and um, for over 40 years, and I still remember the cultural statements that they made when I joined the, t joined the company. 40-some um, years ago, because culture, the brand of IBM is its people, and the people are the culture. It shows up in everything you do. I can go anywhere around the world and get on stage with another IBM I've never met, and we move a certain way, we do certain things, we have certain ethics, we know right from wrong, those types of things. It's really culture, but you can also have a culture on your team, because as a leader, if you let the small things go that kind of go over the line, mm -hmm. what is that telling you to the rest of the team? All right. So we have to look at ourselves as leaders. One of the three um, things for our culture is trust and responsibility in all relationships, internally, externally, everywhere. Yeah. Gregory talked about trust at the beginning. So to the extent you, it's a good question to ask, what is the culture of your company or your organization? And are you exhibiting that every day in everything you do? And, and uh, I totally, totally agree with that. Uh, at North of Grumman, uh, we certainly have a culture of performance and uh, we have a, um, uh, a culture of honesty and integrity. And that same uh, culture bubbles down to all of my teams and all of our teams. Uh, uh, we, we have honest integrity with uh, our subcontractors, our um, any of our teammates, uh, all of our teams. Uh, so, um, and as far as leaders in the in our organization, uh, we have high, very high ethics. Okay, we have about five more minutes, so I'll take the young lady first. So, if if you don't mind, I've been working remotely for thirty years. Okay, not in the same state, the same country, hired people, went on to people, and I still work that way. So I have a lot to say about that, but just very briefly, we celebrate. So um, sometimes on my weekly meetings, we play games, and we have figured out ways so you can't cheat when you're on the other side and Google <laughs> answers and everything. Um, one meeting, I literally discovered what people liked. I Googled their home, I found out the nearest delivery place, and I had lunch delivered Sounds at the time that we were having the meeting. Surprise, surprise. There are a million things that you can do to do that. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to talk with you offline. I won't take up a lot of time on that. But you just have to be imaginative, but it can be done. Yes. So that, that may take a little bit more work. Yeah. And I think most of us are in that situation. We go to a job and we become managers or, yeah. you know, we get a new position. That's going to take more work. But um, it's, it's getting to know the people that work for you right. and with you and what motivates them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have somebody that's motivated by leaving at 3 o'clock, then, you know, that particular person, you know, you may want to schedule them in the mornings to talk to them about their tasking. Um, Again, sometimes you have employees that are there 10, 15 years, and they may have aspirations of, you know, management or other positions or taking even a, a training class, and they might not have been afforded that opportunity. So you sit down. I, I know for me, what I would do, I had, you know, I had my government team, and then I also had contractors that supported us. So when I took over the team, I met with every single one of them individually without other people around say is everything okay do you like what you're doing can you see yourself taking on more responsibility or shifting your responsibility because they have been doing and some are like yeah you know i like this this is fine i'm really happy and another one's like you know i'd like to do a b and c and then you try to you know find something that they can do that can meet what they want so you can always develop people that have already been there and then turn them into high performers on that team. Excellent answer. There was another question. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can so, take the 
ahead. the negative feedback portion, the question. Um, I think we overthink uh, feedback. If you have the right intention to give that feedback and, you un and they understand the why behind it and what you're trying to actually achieve, it's much easier to explain or give the feedback itself. Um, I work in a very feedback-driven environment and it's almost to the point where we might give too much feedback. Um, so it's so easy for us, right? Because we're just letting people know how they show up or what they've done you know, um, in regards to systems or having diff the wrong conversation with folks. Like we just want to help, right? Um, but you have to explain the why. And if you're coming and you're being vulnerable and you're being honest on like why you're giving this feedback, it just makes things so much easier. So I really think we overthink communication sometimes. Um, and it's just, if we just keep it really simple, it makes our job much easier. And choose your words carefully. So I yes. always try to flip the negative into yeah. a positive. Mm -hmm. I always try to coach and say, you know, when you do this the next time, you might want to think about doing it that way. I had, I had a guy, he, he gave me constructive feedback. I didn't know it. And, I, and it's like <laughs> two days later, and I go, wait a minute. He didn't like what I did. <laughs> and I'm sitting there killing myself. Why? Because he had a velvet glove. He, he, he delivered it to me and let me keep my dignity and want to really change and do it another way. So a lot of it is the words you choose. Yeah. And the other thing I was thinking about, if you just say, hey, can I just give you some feedback? That's, it's, it, it makes it a little bit easier. You don't want to go through an opportunity where you're, once you give feedback to someone that they feel like they have to give you a response, right? I, I just want you to hear me out and take it in and see where it goes, right? So just creating that environment is tough sometimes, um, but when you do it, it makes your job so much easier. Yeah, and speak to the technical question, whether you need to be yeah. technical to lead a technical team. So, so to answer that question, um, uh, it certainly, I think it helps. Uh, to have some technical background if you're leading a technical team. Now, do you have to to be uh, uh, totally versed in that area? No, I don't think so. Uh, but I think it I think it certainly will help if you have some technical understanding of what's going on. Because uh, if you don't, I, I be perfectly honest, uh, I think you, you certainly run the risk of being uh, bamboozled. Jack of all trades, master of none, and humble enough to go to your team when you don't know what you're doing, say, tell me what you do. Let me learn about your position and your job. Mm -hmm. And at that point, that's where you pick up that experience. Right. But still having it, some technical knowledge. You gotta have some. Yeah. Yes, young man in the yellow. Aerotech.com. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> Sorry. Shameless. Shameless. <laughs> We're all here for a reason. Yes. <laughs> um, no, seriously. I mean, it's opportunities oh, like this. You got to network yourself. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. You better not be the first to leave this room. You have to be the last. Absolutely. Like you have to, you know, market yourself. You need to talk to her. Yeah, <laughs> and me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, take advantage of these opportunities. Get yourself outside of, you know, the comfort zone itself. Be vulnerable. Explain who you are, what you're looking for. So then, there's a lot of people in this room that can get you to the place that you need to go. Okay, I'm gonna take two more questions, all the way in the back, and then here, and then there. Um, I would say, if I could narrow it down to three words, um, I would say humility, growth, and self-awareness. You know, because to me, those aspects of saying, this is how I need to grow, or how I need to get better, or, you know, it, it all comes to self-discovery. And self-discovery is very, very important when it comes to leadership and management spouse. I agree with Renee. Um, it's being open and honest. It's being vulnerable. It's, it's sharing. Um, it's building trust. Um, those are the things that like come up to my mind immediately. Um, I think uh, certainly trust, relationships, and um, giving back. Uh, I think certainly at, at this point, 
um, get, giving back and, 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 and all that I've learned over these few years, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to give back to, uh, to all those who are willing to uh, accept it. And I'll just add one more. You will grow to be comfortable in your own skin. It's incredible when you're comfortable in your own skin and you're clear about you're trying to drive the business or the goals, people accept you more than when you're putting on a mask and trying to be somebody that you're not. So uh, within the culture of the organization here and then in the blue shirt. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tavon Reynolds. I'm vehicle engineering manager over two teams, uh, two technical teams. And the youngest person on both of my teams is 25 years older than me. Um, they're all subject matter experts. And in the upcoming months, I'll be hiring the next wave of engineers, uh, T1s and T level ones and level twos. Uh, me personally, I feel like I can communicate to both levels. Uh, but do you guys have any advice on how to begin fostering their communication between each other uh, so that I can begin the transfer of knowledge and making sure that that information is being transferred properly? I'll, I'll jump in. There's a lot of work done on generational leadership and generational communications. Um, all the managers in the company take it because we all have different people. For instance, you know, don't necessarily email young people because they don't email or leave voicemails and older people, you know, there's certain ways you want to communicate with them. And, mm -hmm. uh, if you have something quick to add, then I'll go to the last question. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, make sure over the next few months, you just look up some things on working with generations. And then, um, you know, I've had teams like that before uh, where I was managing people about 30 years older than me. And when I walked in the door, I look younger. So when I walked in the door, they thought I was a college student and or just graduating. Um, so that was a situation, this particular situation. I had to be extreme. I had to take my resume and throw it on a tape and be like, is there anything else you'd like to know about me? You know, because it was a it was a hostile environment in the beginning. Right. Um, after a while, it kind of settled down and finding out again what motivated some of those individuals. Some of the older people had been there for a long time and not gotten significant pay raises. And we were on a sole source contract. So at that point, it's me going and fighting for their pay or fighting for benefits and retirement, which was a lot of their motivations. And with the younger individuals that were there, it was fighting for salary because they got hired at unfair um, salaries in the beginning. So when you do those things, it does help build your team. And then also emphasizing the fact that that transfer of knowledge, that transfer of intellectual capital needs to occur. And then you write that into your mission and your goals. So it's very, very clear to your older employees because sometimes they don't want to do the knowledge sharing. They feel like it's, um, you know, and that's one thing you'll find out when you do, you go look up generational um, communication. A lot of them don't want to share sometimes because they feel that the younger generation, they work quicker, they have computers, and they're going to come and take their job. And it's putting everybody at ease and having a trusting environment that really helps with foster that communication there. Okay, we're right at the top of the hour. I'm going to take one last question and ask one panelist to quickly answer. Hi, my name is Tara Henry. I'm a tool engineer with the Boeing Company. Um, I recently took a management position and I'm a little bit, uh, how do I say it? I've had very good managers over the years and I've had some poor managers. And I kind of use that as a guideline of how I want to manage. With you guys going into your first management positions, how did your expectations um, compare to reality of actually being a manager? I would say in our company, they train us. They train us to the health, and they have our employees give feedback. It's painful. And they really develop you. Seriously, they do. They really develop you as a manager. So if you're not getting that training, I would recommend that you look at some outside courses and go to your leadership team and say for your personal development, you'd like to take some outside courses if you're not getting it. Because it's too important to kind of bumble through it. You really want it because once you, your reputation is established, it's kind of hard to get out of it. So you want to hit the ground running, and that's what I would 
recommend. Okay, with yeah, that, good go ahead. I'm good. You're good? I'm good. You've been a great audience. Um, thank you for filling in. I do have one resource that I'd like to put out there. One of the best things I've ever done, seen on leadership is Simon Sinek. Does anybody know Simon Sinek? S-I-N-E-K is the last name. YouTube, it's, it's called um, Start With The Why. I have everybody on my team, including myself, with a one pager that talks the why, the what, and the how. Yeah. And it will change your perception on everything. So you've been a great audience. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening.